Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Vin Weber, an old friend, 12-year mm -hmm. congressman from Minnesota, from 1980 to 92, and mm -hmm. which role he was a key player in the Reagan Revolution, both in legislating it and thinking it through, I would say, and uh, from the beginning, and then in the laying the groundwork for the Republican takeover of the House a couple of years after you left, and then now a general Emmy Noss Grease in Washington, <laughs> conservative Whatever thinker, strategist uh, yeah. on the board of many uh, philanthropic and not-for-profit organizations, including the National Endowment for Democracy, which I think you're chair of, uh, yeah. which is a good right. good organization. Right. It is a good organization. Promoting liberal democracy. An organization proposed by Ronald Reagan. Professor Ronald Reagan, a little not quite inconsistent maybe with Donald Trump's foreign yeah. policy. We can get back and yeah, we'll find talk out. about that. That's actually a big question in my mind, but let's talk about that at some point. Okay. So I think let's begin with, you, you came to, in 1980, you were elected at the same time right. as Ronald Reagan. I, I always say I dragged Reagan in on my coattails. How did you? I'm just curious. <laughs> How did the, had you been in elected politics? I can't remember. Before. No, I'd, I'd managed a Senate campaign for Rudy Boschwitz in Minnesota, who was the first uh, Republican elected in 25 years in the state, and uh, I, who's still doing very well in Minnesota, a great friend of mine. And, and I thought that I was probably going to either work for him throughout his career or maybe go into professional political consulting or something like that. And he talked me into running for Congress and uh, which I, so I'm, I'm not like one of these people that you read about who got up every morning since they were seven years old and thought I'm going to get a run for office, I'm going to be a congressman, blah, blah. I, that was really not me. Uh, he talked me into it, and I did it, and uh, I got elected. Was it a Democratic seat? I can't remember. It was. It, it was a yes. It was, it was the sixth district of Minnesota. It doesn't really exist in the form uh, that it did then now, but it was held by Rick Nolan. Interestingly, a, Demo a liberal Democrat, and I announced against Rick Nolan in October of 1979, and was expecting to run against him. And in February of 1980, unexpectedly, Nolan announced that he was not going to seek re-election. And so I ran for an open seat and won. Great, great. So let's talk about Ronald Reagan, not so much about him, but about Reaganism. There's a, a book I remember not reading, but looking at when I was in grad school uh, by some Italian in the early 20th century. I think Croce was his name. What is living and what is dead in the thought of Hegel? And I guess it occurred to me today, what is living and what is dead in Reaganism today, so many years later, uh, in your yeah. in your judgment. As well, I think what we what we th first of all, I think you have to sort of put Reagan in the context of a of a longer process, maybe beginning with the establishment of the National Review magazine in the fifties, and certainly right. including Goldwater's nomination in nineteen sixty four, and we all had a general sense, or it was actually a fairly specific sense, that that we were. That Reagan represented the replacement of the dominant liberal social welfare state uh, uh, theory that had really dominated American politics from the New Deal on, uh, including through Republican administrations. You know, we we, we had. There, there, was, there was one philosophy that governed America, and Democrats may have pursued it a little more aggressively, and Republicans a little more conservatively, and Republicans were, didn't want to spend quite as much money, and they want a little more effective management. And these, but there was not a big difference between the basic political philosophies uh, of, as we saw it, of Roosevelt, Truman, Nixon, Eisenhower. And Reagan did represent something very different. And at, we thought that the liberal welfare state had sort of run its course. It was you know, no longer yielding returns. And that this was the start of a new era. And I think that there was a lot of legitimacy to that. Um, we also believed absolutely that it was better for all people. And I, I, I make that point in contrast to what I hear from a lot of conservatives today, which is they, they certainly believe that uh, liberal politics, Obama politics, are, are bad and not helpful to the country. But there's less certainty in my conversations with them that if we actually implement the things Republicans want to do or conservatives want to do, that it'll, it'll make life better for the vast majority of people. There's a sense of, well, maybe we'll just have to eat our spinach, but we're not going to like it, but it's better than the alternative. We really thought, uh, we believed that the, the, the shining city on the hill was was a, a symbol in many, many ways to us, not just of the country in the world, but of what we thought we were building in the country itself. And I think some of that's been lost recently, but that's what, that's what we were all about. We were all about trying to change America to a different governing philosophy based on a different set of principles. Economic policy and foreign policy, I mean, which was more important well, we always in, talked about for you and for most people? 
we talked about the, th the three-legged stool of, of Reaganism, which was uh, a strong foreign policy that believed in defeating communism and a advocating democratic and American virtues and ideals and principles around the world. That's still a very important concept. Growth-oriented economics based on free markets and what we now call supply-side economics. And the third piece of it was a little less defined, but it was very important intellectually. That, that is a, a social, a, an approach to social policy based on the strengthening of what academics would call mediating institutions. Reagan talked about the family, the church, the neighborhood, and the workplace, and all as non-governmental institutions, but also different from sort of an atomistic libertarianism right. where, you know, there's there's an individual here and the state there and nothing in between. That was a very important principle to us, and it still is, a, is an important principle, except it's much harder in policy to figure out how you actually do things through government to strengthen those non-governmental institutions. So, I mean, do you think Reaganism, A, does address the issues of the day or what parts of it do? And I suppose then we can talk about politically, is it alive? I mean, is it, is it alive substantively and is it alive politically, I guess? Yeah. Take, take that in whichever order you want, because those are both. Well, I still, think that the, I still think the structure of, that we just talked about of Reaganism makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think like any other political philosophy, the actual application of those principles changes with circumstances and time. Um, but there isn't a whole, I, I always laughed a little bit at, at Obama and the people saying well, this was a new day and new ideas and you know, there's really not much difference in the principles that Obama applied from those that Franklin Roosevelt applied. And, and I don't fault him for that. There, there are some, you know, there's only a limited number of ways that government can approach solving problems and they're based on a, a set of core principles and you adapt them to circumstances, but it's not like you invent some new approach to government totally. I totally agree with that. If I, can say, I mean, I, you know, this probably both reflects the fact that we came to Washington in the 80s, but I guess I got sort of annoyed over the last few years. I was like, well, I mean, everyone knows you can't just go back to Reagan. <laughs> everyone knows you can't just apply Reagan. It's a new era. And blah. Uh, as if, yeah. you know, first of all, as if 30 years is like a brand new era <laughs> compared to, you know, 200 that's, that's, years. That's you exactly know? right. And secondly, as if, as you say, as if the principles are basically correct, yeah. there aren't that many alternatives, yeah. really. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I always I always like the, the quote from that's attributed to Joe N. Lai. You probably, I'm sure you heard it. When someone asked Joe N. Lai uh, what he thought of, how, how, what he thought about the French Revolution, and he said it's too early to tell. Okay. You know? okay. <laughs> Americans have a little different idea of, of how long a political philosophy or theory gets to be tested before you see it work. It's, we want to have immediate results. But I still think that the, the basic core principles that he talked about with different applications for different circumstances make a lot of sense today. And I think we're going to find it. I, take foreign policy, for instance. I, 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 I still believe in strength. And I think that the, a military buildup is necessary now, as it was when Reagan came in. And I think that's almost becoming a consensus position, uh, less consensus, but I believe it strongly, is I think that political stability still requires us to figure out how to promote democracy and human rights around the world. It is not easy, and we've learned some hard lessons and, and had failures in our attempts to do that over the last several years. That is to be sure. But I still try to think of a way that you can have stability and prosperity and, and peace in countries that, that are uh, not governed the way our country's governed. And I, I don't see that there's an alternative anymore. The, the days when we could put the Shah on the peacock throne and have stability through military power in Iran, th those days are pretty well gone. So the notion of, uh, of exporting, if you will, democratic values or helping to establish what we believe are universal values, and that's what Reagan believed, is still an important thing. And, and as opposed to throwing that idea out, we need to figure out how we do it more effectively and better. Now, as you mentioned in introducing me, I, I've spent now 17 years on the board of the National Endowment for Democracy, including being its chairman. And so I'm, I'm very dedicated to this idea. But I also realize the limitations of it, having seen things that didn't work. But it would be a huge mistake to turn away from it at this particular point in our history. And more broadly, and in the same vein, it seems to me, I think we agree on this, that the, the degree to which American power and standing by our allies and sort of being willing to deploy forces and use forces if necessary and also stand up for democracy around the world is sort of key to the whole world order 
which has done a lot of good things in the last 70 years. It's become so, again, I get so annoyed when people are sort of, you know, poop, oh, well, that's, that was then, and now, <laughs> this is now, and everything's a failure, and the, the yeah. costs of abandoning, it seems to me, that basic view, and that is more bipartisan. That's not just Reagan, Truman, and you could say that's the Truman-Reagan view, and I think Obama began the departure from it on the left, and now Trump on the right. And I guess, so how worried are you, well, sticking on foreign policy for a while, about well, I'm, I'm 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 very worried about that. I, I you know it it was a bipartisan view for a long time, initiated probably by the Democrats who were in power after all, after World War II and Harry Truman and people like Scoop Jackson, the United States Senate. Um, but it began to unravel near the end of the Cold War. I always infuriate my Democrat friends by saying, you know, it, it, this was a bipartisan effort at the beginning of the Cold War, but it was pretty much a one-party effort yes. at the end of the Cold War. Uh, Democrats lost their heart for fighting yeah. communism. They had turned, uh, they weren't pacifists, but they had turned in a decidedly anti-militaristic direction. And those last battles, like the battles to put intermediate range missiles in Europe, the fight over the nuclear freeze concept, which was basically the so Soviet negotiating position in arms control talks. The Democrats were all on the other side right. of those issues. Most of the Democrats, always notable and honorable exceptions, but most Democrats were not there. And, and Ra that's why when people say that Ronald Reagan won the Cold War, I think that's a fairly defensible statement. And I do think it's to the honor of the Republican Party that it really carried the burden for those last dozen years or so. I mean, literally in the sense that it was Reagan and Bush who were president. Um, and if you want to go back, almost Nixon, you know, think about it, eight, right. 20 of the last 24 years of the Cold War era were under Republican presidencies. That's and, exactly right. Uh, with a little fair, as you say, not as much Democratic support for this allegedly bipartisan view of American power and the centrality of America standing up to the Soviet Union and so right. forth, yeah, as I, people I, now I don't, think. So. I, I think it's important to make a point. I, I don't think the Democrats in this period we're talking about concluded that that America was equivalent to the Soviet no. Union. And I don't believe that. They, they believed in America as much as any of the rest of us did. But they'd lost their heart for the fight. Right. And uh, they'd lost confidence that we could wage the fight successfully. And so Republicans, and led by Reagan, really had to do that more or less by themselves against a lot of opposition from the left-wing base in the country. Opposition, I mentioned on this, the, the missiles in, in Europe. Uh, aid to the Contras in Nicaragua was one of the most vicious fights all the time that I was in Congress. And the, most of these battles that we look historically at in terms of the Cold War, the, the Democratic Party either vacated the field or were overtly on the other side. And then post-Cold War, it seems to me, from about, let's say, 94, 95 in the Balkans through, what, early post-Iraq, 2004, 2005, so yeah. that's a decade, I guess. You had a pretty good bipartisan consensus about American leadership, both uh, in terms of well, uh, deployment of force, uh, trade, the whole kind of structure of global order. Well, one of the interesting things about that period of time, the, the Clinton period, really, and I'm sure you remember this, but in the 1992 election, a lot of the people who were referred to as neocons, who had, and I think that term no longer really applies to the people to whom it is applied, right. but at the time, a, a lot of those folks had a hard time choosing between Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush because they thought that the Bush foreign policy was too much real polity uh, and, and not dedicated to spreading American values, and they thought maybe Clinton would be better than that. A number of them back Clinton. Gene Kirkpatrick did not back Clinton, but was famously courted by Clinton and thought about it. And, uh, uh, and he did indeed come into office doing a lot of things to spread American values around the world. He made some mistakes, to be sure. Uh, he backed democracy, and, and he completed the two biggest trade agreements, both, both of them initiated by Republicans, NAFTA and GATT, but the two biggest trade agreements may be in the post-World post War II era to that point. And expanded NATO right. with Republican support with Republican in Congress. Support. Yeah. Exactly. But that's, I guess, Iraq. Well, what's the moment where people say on both, in both parties that started to fray? I guess the difficulties in Iraq and then uh, Obama's presidency. I mean, I, and how worried are you now that eight yeah. years of Obama and four years of Trump really means a break from what had been a well, pretty consistent pattern? Let's, yeah, I, I, all of those things matter. I, I think you have to be honest, though, on our side of the ideological. I, 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 I thought George W. Bush was a fine president, and I defend a lot of things that he did. When he ran for office, though, it bothered me that he said we needed a more humble foreign policy. And I 
respect him greatly, and I respect his motivations in saying that, but it grated against me. I, I thought, you know, humble sounds like the word apologetic to me. And I don't think America needs to be apologetic for our foreign policy. I think America, uh, the world needed American leadership then as much. So that was just a little tiny thing, but we began introducing this concept that, that America right. can't overreach and can't, uh, uh, we have to point out some of the flaws in our history. And there's a whole cultural thing behind this, as you're well aware. Uh, the, and it, 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 it was a, a, an unraveling of kind of the view of America's role in the world, the view that America had of itself going forward. And then Obama comes into office and just validates all of this negativism about America's history, the so-called apology tour, which he doesn't like to acknowledge. But, but you know, there, there's, there's all of us, particularly, you know, people like you and me that went to college in the 60s, 70s, you know, we, we know what the, the people on the left at that time really believed. They, they were, they, it was an indictment of America from top to bottom. And I don't say that Obama believes all that or that Bill Clinton believed most of that, but there's that element of thinking there that you know, America, we really have done a lot of bad things. And it ran out of control in the Obama administration. It, it gained dominance, it seems to me, in the Obama administration. That thinking that America is more of a, has been more of a problem in the world than a solution to problems. And then the reaction to it turned out to be Trump, not, you know, let's say the reaction that we would have preferred. I mean, uh, Romney's reaction in 2012 was very consistent with yeah. the sort of Reaganite right. vision of America, kind of the kind of critique that you just made of Obama. Right. Um, but the, having beaten back Buchanan in the 90s, uh, if I can put it that way, and, yeah, right. and then Ron Paul, and it, there's always been that element, obviously, on the American right and in American, among the American public, Fortress America, kind of isolationism. I think that's right. America first. I, I, you could have fooled, I would not have predicted, though, that the, the ultimate, you know, that the, the first Republican president after Obama would be someone who criticized Obama for doing too much too in much, the world, right, not too right. little. I, I would never have thought either. And there is an inconsistency, internal contradiction is probably a better term, in, in Trump's approach. You know, yes, he says we, he criticizes all of our failed foreign military adventures. I don't think that's entirely fair, but that's what he says. And he appeals, appeals to a lot of people when he says that. But at the same time, what, what is his theme? Make America great again. <clears throat> Normally, you would say that a part of a theme like that would include leadership in the world. And I think that for a lot of people it does. And, and it's, you know, it's an example of the ability maybe of the of the country or the polity to hold two ideas in their head at the same time. We we're concerned about overreach in the world. We're concerned about draining America's treasure to pay for everybody else's problems. And at the same time, we we're concerned about the fact that we've lost influence in the world and we want to restore that leadership. Those may be contradictory or they may simply be two different ideas existing by, beside each other. But that's, I don't think that Trump's campaign resolved that at all. And I still don't know which way he's going to go as president of the United States. Yeah, I was going to ask that. So does, which way does reality push him? Does it turn out to be politically easier not to get involved in things because perhaps a war-weary American public won't make him pay a price? Or does it turn out to be easier when reality shows you what happens if America doesn't get involved? Does he end up defaulting more to a well, I, policy that we would like? Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, I think everybody's learned a little bit about the limitations of intervention. We, you know, we, 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 and so I, I suspect that Military and foreign policy advisors are going to be a little more cautious right. about advising intervention, regardless. But beyond that, you know, President Trump's signature is strength. And how how many times are we going to be challenged around the world before he figures out I've got to respond to this or I'm going to look weak? So I would bet that before before he's done, he finds that the uses of American power are pretty important. And Russia have to while we're on foreign policy and now on President Trump. I mean, you've actually done a lot of work on NED has been involved yeah. in Russia, yeah. and oh, you've yeah. done a lot of work yeah. on Putin and Putinism. Let me say a word about that and sort of how, how big a threat is it and how worrisome is it that Trump seems to have it's decided very, to be friendly to Putin. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very substantial uh, as a threat, and I think, you know, in the context of the Cold War, I remember the comment, I'm sure you do, be that people made, why are we so worried about... I can't remember the thinker that says it. Why do we not worry about the British or French nuclear arsenal? 
because we don't have any concerns about the British or French intentions and motivations. That's why we worry about the Russians. Okay, take that forward to now. There are substantial reasons to question the motivations and values of Vladimir Putin and the Russians when it comes to democracy and political order. It's not just that they have a different system than we do. Uh, when I started as chairman of the National Endowment for Democracy in the Bush administration, uh, we worked all around the world. There were a few places where the government made it impossible to work, like Cuba, North Korea, Iran, made it very, very difficult to work in the country. But most places we could go in, and, and our work, by the way, was funding local activists, not sending Americans in to do the work. We fund people from the country that want to build human rights and independent media and move toward democracy. Uh, but we didn't face most of the, pl in most places, active opposition of the governments, except in those exceptions I mentioned. Putin really initiated a change in that that is now spread to many places in the country. He passed what in the trade we call the anti-NGO law. And it's still on the books and people are prosecuted under it, uh, which basically makes it very difficult for foreign-funded NGOs to work to promote human rights, democracy, or political activity in Russia. It was picked up by Hugo Chavez in Venezuela and now has been replicated by autocrats in many other places in the world. Um, and it, he, he, it, it's not just that he is not himself a democratic leader, but that he has a philosophy of st stopping the spread of democracy. That's why we worry about him, and that's why, you know, I, 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 I don't know where the president will go with this. It, to, say, to say that a, re a relationship with Russia would be a, a better thing is something, it's hard for anybody to argue. I'd rather have better relations with, I guess, everybody. But the question always is at, at what cost? Uh, and there's not much evidence that we can do deals with Russia for which we do not pay a far greater cost than we get back in terms of benefits. And I think Judge Jake's also strategically, he so much wants to undermine NATO on his border so that there's, it's not just that he's abstractly spreading the idea of autocracy or funding sort of autocratic types around the world. He's got a practical agenda that cuts against NATO as a core part of that's the security right. structure. I think that that's exactly right. Well, we know that he famously has said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the worst disaster of the 20th century. So he wants to, he'd like to, he'd love to push NATO back. He was KGB, if you were a KGB agent. NATO is the ultimate enemy, you know, it's, uh, and we've, it's, I mean, it is, the, in that case, there is sort of a, an equivalency, not moral equivalency, but an equivalency in that they view NATO the same way we view the KGB and the Warsaw Pact as the ultimate enemy. And, and the difference is that NATO still exists, and he's frightened by it. And you were an elected politician, and you're in touch with a ton of elected politicians. I mean, how, how much is this just, gee, if we had a good articulator of a, the kind of foreign policy you and I would like, the public would r rally to it, and how much is there genuine public resistance and, quote, war weariness and so forth, uh, in your judgment? I mean, it's, uh, it's, there's a little bit of both. I'm, I think that there's a, a, there's a skepticism of our ability as a country to do things effectively in the world. That's, that's more than I would say war weariness. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a doubt that we're going to succeed. Uh, even, you know, the most classic example is the Iraq war, and it's, it's, I do not believe that public opposition to the Iraq war is because we didn't find weapons of mass destruction, so much as it is because in the aftermath of the war, we failed to stabilize Iraq. Yeah. Um, and I think that there are a lot of examples. You get into the democracy promotion world, which I'm talking about a little bit, and they say, well, you know, we promoted democracy in the Middle East, Hamas w wins the election in Palestine and, and things are worse. Uh, we promote democracy in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood comes to power, we can't do anything right, and hence we shouldn't do anything. I think the, 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 const, the notion that we can't succeed in doing things is much more important to the understanding the public's mood than simply a war weariness implying, well, I can't take this anymore, I just I don't want to. I don't think that's it. Um, so I, that's I, interesting. I do think that, that a president who articulates the need for America to get involved in the world is going to find that the country rallies behind him. You know, this is not with, really without precedent. When Saddam Hussein came, went in and took Kuwait, 
we were still in a period that we talked about as the Vietnam syndrome, where Americans were not going to be in favor of intervening anywhere in the world because of the horrible experience of the Vietnam War. And Bush articulated the reasons why and a strategy for pushing Saddam Hussein out of, out of Kuwait. And uh, the country rallied behind him very strongly. Uh, and we succeeded. I, th I still think that that's likely the case if, if, the, if President Trump found a place in the world where he thought American interests needed us to intervene militarily and he explained it to the country, I think the country would back him. I don't think this is a, this is not a reflexively isolationist or pacifist country in my view. But it wants to succeed. It right? wants to succeed. I mean, I find one problem is I try to make the step back one, one, one foot and say, but look, over 70 years, this general mix of policies, let's call it internationalist, somewhat interventionist, mm -hmm. free trade, uh, yeah, has succeeded. I mean, just if historians are going to look at 1945 right. to 2015 and say hundreds of millions, maybe billions of people come out of poverty. There's, there are no very few really major wars, et cetera. Absolutely. So they, Absolutely. It's very hard. I just think it's very hard for people to make the case that the U.S.-led post-Cold War order wasn't a, hasn't been a historical Huge success. success. But you make that argument somehow, and it seems, oh, that's backward-looking, and it's kind of, I don't know, complacent, and you're, all you're doing is asking people to keep on doing what they've been doing. I mean, I, as an actual politician, I'm just curious, I mean, is there, a, I don't know, do you have advice for people on how to make that argument going forward in a way that's more compelling? Does one just well, have to wait till there's disasters in various places yeah. and say, hey, look, you know? No, it's, um, a, it's, a, it's a tough situation. I, I, I'll, I'll take the conversation just a little different way, because you use, use an important word, internationalist which I always described myself as being a, a Republican conservative internationalist. But the word that has become discredited now is globalist. And I think there's the distinction between those two words actually leads to a fairly important discussion. People like you and me uh, believed, and Ronald Reagan, believed that the United States needed to lead in the world, and we needed to lead through trade, and political activity, and if necessary, military activity. And we were internationalist in that sense. A lot of the reaction, though, in the last few years, whether it's the Brexit vote in Britain or a lot of the reaction to Trump, is a reaction against not just American leadership in the world, but America sacrifice, or nations sacrificing sovereignty to, quote, global institutions. That was a big part of Brexit. And the, 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 I was over there quite a bit uh, in, in London in the lead up to and aftermath of the Brexit one. And I didn't hear so much about manufacturing jobs and things like that. I heard about bureaucrats, unelected bureaucrats in Brussels taking away our sovereignty. And I think you've heard bits and pieces of that in this country, and resentment of the United sure. Nations. And things. So I, I think that we have to differentiate between what I would call internationalism and what has been discredited now as, quote, globalism. I, I, I am a nationalist. I believe in America. I don't want America to sacrifice its sovereignty to the UN or anybody else. But I am also an internationalist in the sense that I think America needs to be involved in the world, lead in the world. And if we can make that distinction, I think that's still where most people in this country would be. But they don't want to give up control of their lives to multinational, international institutions, which are in many ways, anti-democratic or at least undemocratic. I guess the political question is, does that, let's call it Reaganite internationalism, which is different from both, I don't know, like liberal, globals, globalist, citizen, citizen, of, the citizen world, of the world, worldism yeah. on the one hand, and let's say narrow, ethnic nationalist, you know, yeah. kind of nativism yeah. on the other, yeah. to caricature it a little. Yeah, does that find political, I mean, that presumably still is a Republican, do you think as just going forward as a practical matter, is that a Republican Will that find its home in the Republican Party? Conceivably, could it be? Could, could Democrats rediscover the, their inner Harry Truman or Scoop Jackson? Uh, I think that's very unlikely. Yeah, I think uh, I think the Democrats have gone way off to the left, and uh, you know you got a couple of generations of Democratic leadership now that have come out very suspicious of America's past leadership as well as their current leadership in the world. And I think it's it's highly unlikely the Democrats are going. The Democrats are moving to the left. I don't know how far or radically, but I don't think that they are likely to rediscover their Truman-esque past. They're more likely to go the other direction. The, there's a question about where the Republicans are going to go, though, and I think that's a big question facing the country. And it sort of leads to the question about does the two-party system itself 
you know, make as much sense as it has throughout most of our lives. Um, the president, President Trump, has an opportunity to give definition to that. I mean, the, 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 the people most suspicious of globalism, obviously, are Trump supporters. And if he can articulate a role for America in the world that is, that is consistent with, you know, sort of an anti-globalist view, he may well unite the Republican Party around a vision that's, that, that, that brings back those people that most feel like American sovereignty has been lost. I, you know, I don't know if that's what his goal is or if that's what he wants to do, but you know, I try to, I'm, I'm an optimist. I think that he can do that. But it's a sort of a fight for the future of the Republican Party, presumably, leaving bracketing the question yeah. of the two-party system, which we should come back to, because that's yeah, right, very right. interesting as a, as a speculative, maybe not just a speculative matter. But trade, I, I sort of, yeah, I was thinking about it as you spoke, I mean, trade, which there had been a bipartisan consensus on eroding on the Democratic side, right. pretty strong on the Republican side. Very strong. I mean, TPP, the Asia deal, which you were involved in, I think, making the case for and arguing for with your former colleagues, got big support among Republican senators as recently as, what, 2015? Didn't they vote? I guess they didn't oh, vote yes. on the bill, but they, they voted, voted on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Trade Promotion Authority. Fast track, which, the ability which, which to pass the ability the to pass it, which was um, in many ways the key vote. It was assumed if you gave them, the, the president, the authority they needed to negotiate it, that Congress would ratify. And that got, I don't know, 80% of the Republican yeah, senators or yeah, something. So, yeah, no, it was very popular. And then, but then to nominate, and I do, so just getting back to the Democrats for a second, I mean, I kind of agree with you just to move from uh, international policy, uh, geopolitical policy to trade. I mean, will we see a free trade Democrat, not presidential nominee again in the next couple of cycles? Not I doubt it, not right? A chance, not, not a chance. chance. Though there was one, if you think about it. Bill Clinton. Yeah, and even Obama didn't. Obama ended, remember, ended up being, I don't remember what he said, he said as the a campaign, candidate, but he was he careful, ended being, and he, he ended, ended up, up being, being in that tradition. So that's a huge change. And then, on the, of course, even more striking on the Republican side, the party that had really stuck with that throughout, really, the, uh, Trump runs explicitly against it. It wasn't a little part of Trump's message either, right? Expl the horrible uh, trade deals, uh, NAFTA. Uh, absolutely. And, and NAFTA, the worst agreement in American history. And now... For, let's let's see what actually happens. In right. the first weeks of his administration, President Trump didn't change his mind on NAFTA, but he described it very differently. We're going to make some adjustments to it here. He's met with the Canadian Prime Minister. He's met with the Mexican President. He's talked about doing it and altering the deal in ways that are good for both sides. That's very different than calling it the worst agreement in American history and saying we're going to rip it up and throw it away. And I, by the way, it it wasn't the worst agreement in American right. history. It was a very successful agreement in many, in just about every way. So not throwing that away is a, is a is a really important thing. One of the things that's frustrating about the debate about NAFTA, I was involved in a, a co-chaired a group on the outside to help the Clinton administration get NAFTA passed. And one of the things that we always said explicitly was. Yes, this is going to be good for America, but it's also good for America precisely because it's good for Mexico. We didn't want 120 million poor people seething with resentment of America on our southern border. And now it's sort of like, well, if we give any benefits to those, to those Mexicans, that, that's, there's, that, that's incomprehensible and it's unfair to American workers. You know, you, you, have, to, you have to think about as I'm sure you can, and remember the, all those decades when we, when Mexico was nothing but a problem for us on our southern border, and really to rise their standard of living is in our interests, and I think that's kind of underscores that that underscores a lot of our approach to trade, which was yeah we're gonna this is going to be beneficial to other countries. It's not a zero sum game. We'll be better off. They'll be better off, and we'll be better off because they're better off. And even in with China, where there probably, you know, there has been, I'd say, more damage to parts of the American economy than certainly yeah. from Mexico. Um, you know, it's in our interest, presumably, to have a China that's getting more prosperous and probably, therefore, more open to, you know, political liberalization well, as well, well it's than a place that's just a horrible, seething mass of... Exactly you know, right, exactly. And it's in our interest to try to bring them into a rules-based trading system, because there's no question a state can unfairly compete, and the Chinese do that. I don't know if they're currency manipulators or not, but they certainly use the power of the state to advantage right. themselves as much as they can. Um, but that's an argument for integrating them into a trading system based on rules and law and transparency as opposed to trying to isolate them. 
But that, I found the debate over the TPP, the Asia deal with our Democratic allies, not with China, particularly depressing in that respect. And so that's a deal that's negotiated by presidents of both parties, really. Right, uh, right. Begins under Bush, I think, and then Obama finishes it with democratic nations in Asia. So from a geopolitical point of view, it's a sort of pro-democracy, strengthening our relations with our sure. allies, Japan, Australia, et cetera. Uh, and from an economic point of view, who knows if it benefits us much or a little, but pretty hard to make the case that it hurts us in any serious way. We already have a huge amount of trade with those countries anyway. And for both parties to stand up, I found this personally kind of unnerving in 2016 in the debates. And agree, this TPP, that's no good. I mean, what is it? if you're a foreign leader, what does that say about what's happening in America? It just, it's such a reversal from 70 years of movement in that direction. Which, and so I want you to address that because you did a lot of work, I think, uh, in trying to sell the TPP. But also more broadly, sort of the earlier point I made, I mean, free trade, it's become so unfashionable to just make the perfectly common sense point that, you know what, it's been kind of good for the world to have more or less free trade and free movement of capital for the last 70 years. Yeah. And that's not to say that tiny tweaks and little things can't be adjusted. And it's not to say there aren't losers from free trade. But the degree of apologizing for something that is been on net a pretty big benefit to the world. I find that a little startling. So I might say. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I very much agree with that. And I don't know exactly what the remedy to all that is, but people have been convinced of something that's just not true, which is that their lives have been disadvantaged on balance by, quote, unquote, free trade. And, and, and it, it's preventing discussion of some more serious underlying issues, not problems, but issues that people need to deal with, like I mean, the fact that we're not educating people properly for the jobs right. of the future, that we're not training people to take advantage, to utilize the technologies that are indeed displacing people from lots of jobs. These are complicated issues. They don't, it's much easier to have sort of a bumper sticker campaign that says, the Chinese and Mexicans are taking your jobs, we're going to stop that. And I, 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 I well, it, it's, it disappointing in the sense that it's always required sort of leadership at the top on trade. There's always been the possibility that you could rouse people at the grassroots up against trade. But we had responsible leaders in both parties that came forward and, and resisted that, pushed back against that, and tried to argue strongly for the benefits of America. And, and, and we haven't seen much of that. We, we saw it in, in, from either party's candidates in the last election. Uh, I, you know, I, I, the, I will say in one regard, Trump's position is more admirable on that than Clinton's because I think he believes it. Right. I don't think Mrs. Clinton believed what she said. She simply vacated the field on a, on a set of policies that her husband had embraced and successfully ushered through the Congress of the United States, and, but she caved in the face of pressure from the Democratic left, and, and as a result, there are no voices anymore uh, articulating a, the case for trade, the case for a, a liberal global order. And, and our, our friends, my friends, your friends on Capitol Hill, Republicans who believe what we believe are notably silent at this point. At some point, they're going to have to find their, their voice. I, mean, I suppose we can just avoid regre regress in the trade issue for the next four years. It's not the end of the world. It's well, not, what, do you, what, what, what do you think? I mean, no, I mean no, how I, worried are you that the, you really get a kind of a genuine uh, spiraling of protectionism and so Well, I'm, I guess I'm less worried than I was during the campaign. I mean, I, I was despondent during the campaign <laughs> because the rhetoric from both candidates was so horrible about trade. Now, what's happened since the election, though, is that the Trump administration has describing, in, in describing their trade policy, particularly to Republicans on Capitol Hill, have been very careful to not describe it as a protectionist policy and simply describe it as a better strategy for trade promotion or liberalization. I don't want to try to put words in their mouth, but it's not implausible. You know, I, I believed in GATT, NAFTA, TPP, TTIP, all those multilateral trade deals. What the president has really said is not that he wants to be protectionist, but he doesn't believe in multilateral deals. He wants bilateral agreements. Okay, that's not the strategy that we've been pursuing, but it is a strategy that we have pursued at times. We did free trade agreements with Canada before we did NAFTA. We did free trade agreements with Israel. The notion that you would pursue bilateral agreements as part of a strategy of trade promotion and liberalization is not necessarily implausible. And if that's what 
President Trump and Wilbur Ross and Bob Lighthizer, the new USTR, are going to pursue. You know, we'll see if it works. I think we're, I think people that believe what you and I believe and what Paul Ryan believes and what most Republicans on Capitol Hill believe should try to support that kind of a strategy with the, with the thought in mind that this is the new way in which we're going to continue to pursue the old goal, which is a liberalization of the world trading order. How about the liberal order at home? I mean, that was very much part of Reagan. I'm not sure how it fits into the fee stools exactly. Maybe it's neglected a little bit, which is basic rule of law, basic limited government. Obviously, that's something that's never quite government's never as limited as it in practices and theory, and there's always been yeah. some picking of winners and losers and some, you know. But uh, the degree to which I'd say conservatives and the people who allegedly care a lot about that, and, and, and just to finish that point, I mean, the Constitution and constitutionalism was a key part of the Reagan agenda in the sense of the Supreme Court, the critique of judicial activism, the commitment to uh, judges like Scalia and Bork and now Robert, uh, maybe Roberts, I think Roberts would fit still, and Alito and Thomas and all that. Um, and there, Gore, Trump has been con consistent in the sense of uh, the Gorsuch nomination and sounding that way, at least, mm -hmm. about the courts. But then he, you know, berates individual companies and praises individual companies, and that's something that really would have been, uh, conservatives would have been allergic to that before. And, I mean, how worried are you about the sort of in internal liberal democracy question? Well, I'll... I'll if that, if that's a, if, I don't know if that's a coherent way of putting the question yeah, no, exactly. I, I, I know what you're saying. I, ch I choose to not believe <laughs> that President Trump is going to fundamentally violate in, in internal rules, rule of law. I, I just don't think that he's going to do that. I mean, they are a new administration. They're not experienced. They may stumble, but I, I'm, I'm, I just believe they're going to act consistently with our traditions and our values. I do think that it, it, a little different way of looking at your question is this. One of the things that has always been kind of interesting to people is the fact that you elected Ronald Reagan, most anti-government president, you know, since, you know, I don't know, Coolidge. And during his presidency, confidence in government rose dramatically. Right. And I don't think those two things are at all inconsistent. I think that for, for I think that Americans, contrary to what our most libertarian friends would like to see, do think that there's a role for government, and they're ready to support governmental action probably more than most very conservative Republicans would like. But their confidence in government has to be premised on the notion that government itself understands its limitations. And I think in, that's what they saw in Reagan. They, they saw, in, well, we don't need to worry about government getting too far out of control. We got Ronald Reagan in the office. He, he's, he can do the things that he wants to do. We'll, be, we'll support him. But we know he has a sense of the limitations of government. Maybe that's what helped Clinton a little bit when he said the era of big government is over. Aha, we have a president that recognizes the limitations of government. I think that Obama suffered a lot because that notion was erased and the public did not think that he had any sense of the limitations of government, that he would raise taxes as much as he possibly could, that he would spend as much as he possibly could, that he would regulate as much as he possibly could, and that he would expand executive authority as much as the law would possibly allow him to do. And, and it, it's why confidence in government, it's one of the reasons why confidence in government is very low. I think President Trump ought to you know, kind of think about that, that, that it's, he, he needs to reassure people that he understands the limitations of government. Certainly there's a lot of things in the way he's conducted himself that's, that lead you to believe that. I mean, I don't think he's a conservative ideologue, but he's appointed a lot of people that are very much limited government conservatives. He's talked about deregulation and things like that. Uh, it's not quite the same as reassuring people that you understand that there are limitations to your power as, as, a, as an executive. And that rules and regulations, even if they're sometimes tedious and stuff, are kind of important. Kind of a, important, yeah. Yeah, in a democratic process. I mean, I'd yeah. say that, that I'm a, and I'm a bit a little startled by how many members of Congress are just willing to, who talked a lot about that. Can't Government can't pick winners or losers, not just because it won't work yeah. economically, but yeah. because it's sort of inappropriate. You know, there's a reason we believe in free markets beyond the economic utility of markets. We think it's sort of a fairer way for decisions to be made or, or, you know, impersonal kind of way of making, of letting decisions be made as opposed to, you know, a third yeah, world picking, kind yeah. of thing. And I, yeah. I guess I'm struck how many people have been willing to excuse Trump's third worldism on our side, but maybe they think it's sort of, you know, 
uh, episodic and a little bit of a initial. Re- he'll he'll walk away. He'll move well, away from that. I don't know. I take I take heart from the fact that when the president has scored victories with companies, and he, he always describes their activity as being premised at least partially on the fact that they're going to have an administration that reduces their tax burden and reduces their regulations. You know, it's, it doesn't answer your question about the propriety of a president targeting individual companies, but it puts it in a context that is more consistent, I think, with, right. with, with the way that we think economic policy should be conducted. So it seems that Reaganism, you think, is, uh, I mean, it is alive and well, or in principle, can be and could be. I mean, do you find hard among younger, you spent a lot of time on the Hill, younger members of Congress, younger Republican activists, people in, Michigan, in your state of Minnesota who were thinking of running, you know, the young Vin Webbers of today who were, how old were you when you got elected to Congress? 28. The 28-year-olds 28, who were thinking yeah. of running today. I mean, you're in touch with them, right? They come see you yeah, and get advice yeah. and stuff. I mean, they're I, very, I, I, think, I think. What's your sense I of think, that I think general? That they're, they're very idealistic. And I think in this sense, just having a Republican president is going to be really helpful. Because as long as, during the Obama years, I, you know, I, I, so we started out talking a little bit about this at the beginning. I talked to so many people that didn't really have any positive vision for what their kind of government, their philosophy would accomplish. Because the objective was we had to stop Barack Obama, who people believed was going to overreach to the far left. You know, average people said he was a socialist. You know, the elites would never use that word, but that was what a lot of grassroots were like. And the, the objective of people running for office is we have to stop this. And that's not a positive or idealistic approach. It's also not a bad approach. I mean, if you can stop government from doing bad things, that's an accomplishment. But it's not a coherent governing philosophy going forward. I think the very fact that we have a Republican president now is changing that a little bit. And as I've talked to people in my home state and elsewhere that are thinking about running for government for office, they're encouraged. They think we've got a Republican president. They're open to our ideas. We can actually do good things. Let's think about some good things we can do now. We don't need to worry about stopping all these horrible, you know, ex- expansions of the state and retreats from the world that Obama was presiding over. We can actually think about doing some good things in the world, consistent with values of limited government and market orientation and traditional values. I mean, when you were in Congress, that was a key thing. You didn't limit yourself to supporting Reagan. You had the Conservative Opportunity Society and various uh, groups and forums and yeah. books and publications and conferences that are trying to make the case for really for younger, I'd say, conservatives and right. Republicans, a positive agenda. Right. That's and and, and th- thinking politically about what was accomplished from Reagan on and, and then what was not accomplished. Uh, one way of thinking about it is this. Uh, most of my life until yours, until Reagan got elected, th- th- it was a democratic country. And if you asked people which party they had confidence in on virtually any issue, they'd say, well, I have more confidence in the Democrats. Now, they may have behaviorally gone to the polls and voted for Richard Nixon or Dwight Eisenhower, but if you say, well, which, which party is better for the economy? Well, it's the Democrats because the Republicans gave us the Depression. Which party is better for foreign policy? Well, it's the Democrats because they led us through World War II. And, uh, that's why they were Democrats. By the time Reagan got through his first term, even, that had changed in some very substantial ways. The majorities in the country, big majorities, believed the Republican Party was the party of prosperity, the Republican Party was the party better able to handle the economy, the Republican Party was the better party to create jobs, really a remarkable accomplishment from the party of Herbert Hoover. And of course, we owned the national security issue. George McGovern and, the Dem- and Jimmy Carter gave us that. But we So in these two great big zones, foreign policy, national security, and the economy, the Republicans had transformed the image of our party in substantial ways. Where we had not done that was in kind of a third zone of what we'd call what, social policy, in, in, not in terms of hot button issues, but in the way that political scientists would talk about social policy. Democrats were still the party for health care and the environment and education, education and all of those issues. And that's what we thought at that, by the end of the Reagan administration, the Bush administration, that's what we thought the new frontier was. If we can figure out how the Republican Party can propose solutions, again, consistent with our values and, and programs to address those issues, that's how you achieve some dominance for the Republican Party. And it, it hasn't happened and it didn't happen. Um, and that whole zone of issues is probably today why people say that the government has failed so much. 
People tried to make it happen, I guess, intellectually. There were reformer cons who were similar, I would say, yeah. in spirit to what you did in the 80s. And, uh, but somehow it never, well. Well, you know, and, and George H.W. Bush talked about a thousand points of light. And George W. Bush talked about compassionate conservatism. And we had a reform agenda in the W. Bush administration on, on education and health care. But uh, didn't quite didn't quite get there. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I guess we've been discussing Donald Trump as a kind of Republican president, yeah. but that's half, that's true, of course, but it's, we've sort of neglected the other side of the equation, which is he's an extremely unusual Republican president, having had no particular affiliation with the Republican Party until very recently. Right. Right. Obviously the first president ever, I guess, not to have held either elective office or cabinet office or ever having been a general in the United right. States military. Right. So that's part of even a broader um, novelty of Trump. But I mean, on the issue of, I want to talk generally about the parties and the party system, which I, you and I, I think both have the instinct could uh, change in a pretty big way. But what about Trump's election? I mean, uh, not so much on the issues, but who he is. Not a party guy, a huge celebrity. We really haven't had someone like that elected president uh, since Eisenhower, but he was a general. <laughs> it's kind of different. So uh, ever, really, in, yeah. in our lifetime, certainly, and before that, I mean, really. Well, there's always been, you know, the, the American system has always been potentially a little more lax in enforcing your party choice than other systems around the world. You're, I'm a Republican because I choose to be a Republican. I guess I, not because I'm, you know, sorted out of right. being something else. And, and normally people that, that run for office, you know, sort of adhere to sort of a tradition of being in the party. And even Reagan, who's maybe the most famous party changer, right. you know, he, he started backing Republicans in 1960 when he backed Nixon for president and spent, you know, it was 20 years that he was a Republican, or at least behaviorally, before he actually ran for, well, became, got elected president. Donald Trump t t t pushed it to a different level, though. He was basically a Democrat not very many years ago. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is that in his coming into the Republican Party, he didn't really try to establish himself as a true blue convert to Republicanism or anything like that. He basically said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm and I think he was saying more or less, I'm like most of you, you know. I'm not, buy, I don't buy into this whole two-party system. I got there are flaws with both parties. I'm running for president. I'm going to run for president as a Republican and try to make my peace with the Republican Party, but I am basically an independent. Those are not his words. Those are my interpretations right. of, of how he approached it. And it makes some sense if you think about it this way. The, the Gallup poll last year showed that the, rec the number of independents self-identified in our political process is at a record level, 41 percent, more than both than either Democrats or Republicans. So President Trump was basically reflecting what was going on in the country. Most people are saying, I, I don't have much use for the two parties. But we do have a system where it's pretty hard to get elected if you're not part of one of the two parties. Donald Trump said, I'm going to be a Republican. And what he did say, though, I think, and this was important, is I will be good on the gun issue. So the, one of the major Republican interest groups was fine with him. I'll be pro-life, and I'll appoint pro-life or pro-Supreme uh, yeah. Court justices consistent with right, right, uh, right. not embracing Roe v. Wade, let's put it that way. Um, and a couple of other issues he uh, kind is of— Issues, by the way, not embraced by the Republican establishment when Reagan ran for the nomination. Isn't I mean, that interesting? Yeah. But doesn't that show—I mean, you made this point in a separate conversation we had— the interest groups are in a way more powerful than the party. I don't know that he could have gotten away with not uh, being sound on the gun issue. Uh, right? You're totally right. I think that's an important thing to understand just in the context of what's happened to partisanship in this country. It always strikes me. We decry the partisanship of recent years. We decried it when Bush was in office and we decried it when Obama's in office. And we're already hearing people decry it now the Trump snobs. The partisan, what we describe as partisanship has been accompanied by the weakening, not the strengthening of our political parties, in my view. And the, many of the functions of political parties have been taken over by interest groups. Yes, on the financial side, that's what a lot of people focus on because you can now, now raise money quite independent of parties. But I'm thinking more on the, the issue side. You know, it, it, if, if you're a Republican, as your comment about 
President Trump indicated. You want to make sure that you're okay with the gun people. You want to make sure you're okay with the pro-lifers. You want to make sure you're okay with the anti-tax crowd. All of which, by the way, happen to be my positions. <laughs> so I'm not saying these are illegitimate positions. But they have supplanted party leaders in terms of determining the agenda of, of candidates. And on the left, you better be right with the feminists. You better be right with the LGBTQ lobby. You better be right with the most extreme uh, environmentalists uh, and, and public employee unions. And they've taken the place of the Democratic Party. That's led to a weakening of the parties substantially. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and parties don't mean the same thing as they used to. Yet we have a system in America, particularly, where it's very difficult to come to power outside of the two-party structure. And I believe that's coming, maybe coming to a breaking point or a, to, a, to a, 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 a point of uh, rupture. Yeah, so, I mean, and celebrity presumably helps bring it to a point of rupture, right? That, I mean, yeah. you, can, you yeah. don't have to work your way up and get the blessing of the party, party bosses. That's partly because of the nominating practices of primaries, not conventions, and, yep. and yep. Uh, primaries of the presidential system. But um, so, I mean, you're from Minnesota, now that it occurs to me, Jesse Ventura actually won as a celebrity third party, independent candidate, right. against a pretty well-respected Republican, actually, well, he, he, and a Democrat. He, 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 I mean, he, he ran, yeah, that's the, 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 the story on Jesse Ventura has been misinterpreted yes, when, pe when, when people say, well, he beat two weak candidates. That's not true at all. Uh, Norm Coleman was the mayor of the city of St. Paul, clearly the most um, uh, popular Republican figure in the state at that time. Skip Humphrey was the incumbent attorney general, son of the late Hubert Humphrey, the most popular elected official uh, in either party in the state. Those are the two people that Jesse Ventura beat. And what happened in 98? I mean, the rest of us sort of watched it and didn't, you know, governor's races, if you don't live in the state, you don't pay much attention, and he's like a wrestler, and it just seemed like, oh my God, these fluky things happen occasionally, but was, uh, they, was uh, it a precursor or something? I, I you mean, know, I think at a certain level it was, and not at, not at every level, it's not a perfect level, obviously. I think the level at which it was a precursor was if you listen to him talk and how he talked politically. He didn't talk like any other politician. I think that's true of Donald Trump as well. I, and and people resonated to that not because he said things so much that they agreed with, <clears throat> although they probably did, but but more because he's not talking like those typical politicians. Norm Coleman, my dear friend, and, and Skip Humphrey's my friend, too. They, they were very good, but they were very good conventional politicians. They talked like politicians. And Jesse Ventura would say things that just offended people, you know, all over the place. You know, he, he, was, he asked by a group of students, um, famously, uh, what, what he was going to do for student loan, to finance students' college educations. He says, if you're smart enough to get into college, you ought to be smart enough to pay for college. Now, nobody else would say that. Right. It's insensitive. It's you know sacrificing our future. Or you can say that because you're a wealthy performer. He said it, it was just fine. He insulted welfare mothers, uh, it, it, and yet it, that's nobody put it into an issues matrix and said, well, he's wrong on this and he's wrong on that. They thought I, he's refreshing in a in a strange way, and you might call it a vulgar way, but. He's refreshing. He's not talking like a politician. We saw a lot of that with Donald Trump. How often did Donald Trump say things that we thought were offensive and that were going to disqualify him? And I don't think to, to the average person they said, damn right, that's what I think. They, they sort of said, finally somebody is not talking to us in this political blather that we've become accustomed to. So I think that was a forerunner in that way. And Schwarzenegger, I guess, a little bit too, maybe in California. Schwarzenegger is another example. So yeah. I wonder, so is that, so... Okay, so we have a president. He's he's governing now as a pretty partisan Republican, ironically, not yeah, having been a Republican, yeah. right? He doesn't less outreach to Democrats, I would say, than in a typical beginning of a Republican administration or even the reverse or even Democratic administration, less outreach to Republican. You know, he really is, maybe that's just because he thinks he can't get any votes of people who, any support from the current Democratic Party, but... Yeah, it's, it's hard to, I, I think that's an important point. It's hard to say whether, I mean... You can imagine a scenario in which he would have come into office and had a very nonpartisan administration, right. reached into Congress and grabbed a bunch of people on infrastructure and other things and appointed the Secretary of Labor that was blessed by the AFL-CIO right. because, after all, he got a lot of working class votes. And he didn't do that at all. And, and you, you, 
you're left wondering, well, is that because we maybe didn't quite understand him or because he understands how polarized this political environment is and he couldn't get anywhere with those people? I don't know the answer to that, but he has, you're right, started his administration at least as a, as a conventionally conservative Republican with a couple of little exceptions around trade maybe. But other than that, very conservative Republican administration. Still the way he got there was defeating Bush, so the, the, the heir to the Republican throne, right, and then right. defeating Clinton, the yeah. uh, heir to the Democratic throne. And, and I do think in, in 2016, Sanders getting 45% of the vote against Clinton, uh, Trump getting 45% against uh, the field, does suggest a lot of dissatisfaction with the orthodoxies of both parties and a willingness to look outside. I mean, Sanders was an independent. Sanders, yeah, Sanders never said he was a Democrat. So you had this, that's a good idea. So 45% of the electorate voted for a not, you know, someone who hadn't been a Democrat until right. a year before and someone who hadn't been a Republican until a few years before in the Democratic and Republican primaries. So where does that go? I mean, what? And, and well, I, I, th I think, you know, the, the people have commented for years that in any other country we would be a three or four or even five party political system, that, 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 that the, the artificial duopoly that exists uh, doesn't really reflect the range of opinions in, in the United States. And, and I, th I think that there has been some truth to that. Um, and I think it's getting to the point that that's, people are not going to accept that anymore. Uh, we do have structural impediments right. to a third party candidate, mainly geographic districts, the electoral college, winner take all elections, right. makes it very difficult for a third party to do anything other than be a spoiler. But if you think differently about Donald Trump and you think of him N not as a Republican president, but as an independent president who took over the Republican Party, you can think a little differently about that. And you can th see how other candidates could come forward and say, that's my party, however you want to describe it, the, the, the Trump party or the Sanders party on the left. You know, and I, and I make their own decisions about whether or not they want to use the Republican Party and the Democratic Party as a vehicle, as Donald Trump did. But but maybe not. And uh, uh, there are challenges to the efforts, uh, challenges to the existing two-party duopoly, if you will. Uh, our friend Peter Ackerman has been challenging that uh, for your viewers, businessman, scholar, former dean of the, or, or uh, former chairman of the board of the Fletcher School of Diplomacy, also a hugely successful businessman. And he's been trying to find an avenue for third parties to succeed at the presidential level for a long time. He had a big victory this year in that he won a lawsuit against the Committee on Presidential Debates. And there is now, I'd say, a majority likelihood that in the next campaign, four years from now, there will be more than two candidates on the stage in the national presidential debates, which is a very big deal. Uh, it's presidential debates are, the, the, the Commission on Presidential Debates, in my view, I don't want to get too far off our topic. That's oh, interesting. But the, the Commission important. on Presidential Debates did one very important thing, and in so doing, they created, in my view, a problem. The, the important thing they did was they institutionalized the notion that the presidential candidates will indeed debate, which had been in question from time to time. There's no question anymore. You're going to debate. You're going to debate because we have this organization. But the, the, the negative side of that was that they institutionalized only Republican and Democrat candidates. The last candidate to be in presidential debates was Ross Perot, and under the current rules that the CFPB has set down, Perot would not have qualified. Uh, in this campaign, Gary Johnson did not qualify. Now, you can say Gary Johnson said a lot of goofy things in the campaign. He wouldn't have been a good president. But that's not the point. The, the, the point is that a candidate who was thought to be at least a credible candidate at, at most at, at some point did not get a chance to, to succeed or fail in front of a national audience, and the country tunes them out. If, if they don't think you're going to be on the stage debating, you're not a real candidate, and you can't raise money, and you can't get volunteers. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that there are really only two candidates. And the CFPB, having institutionalized the notion that we will debate, has now frozen out anybody other than the Republican or Democratic candidate. Peter Ackerman is challenging that, perhaps successfully. So going forward, how does it happen? I mean, it's hard to predict these things, of course. I mean, I mean, could Trump, for example, himself break up the two-party system as president? I think that's a really good question. Um, it depends on how he feels about 
the Republican Party. I mean, he clearly has a hugely independent spirit. I think that he's uh, accommodated himself to the Republican leadership, and they've accommodated themselves to him. But, uh, you know, it, we, you don't know how that relationship is going to develop over the course of the next three, four years. And I don't know what he's going to do about re-election, but an incumbent president deciding to run outside the two-party system is very different than a first-time candidate trying to run outside the two-party system. Very different in the sense of much more doable. Much more doable. you're the incumbent. You're the incumbent. You're and I, you mentioned this to me, I think it was last night, honestly, and so I, you deserve all credit for thinking this. I had never really speculated about that, but why couldn't he do it? He fights Republicans in Congress, let's say. Let's say they have a bad 2018, so it's not such a great brand anymore, so to speak. You know, it's not, yeah. uh, you sort of wanted to be the Republican in 2016 after eight years of the Democrats, but usually the the eight-year cycle holds, and so it's probably not bad to have that party nomination. I think Trump thought that way, and easier than getting on the ballot as an independent, and then you're Ross Perot, and you probably don't make it. But if you're an incumbent, and then you get in a fight with the Republicans, and you're fighting with the Democrats, but you're still, let's say, reasonably popular, but maybe you kind of think deep down, I'm more likely to get 40% of the vote than 50% of the vote, why don't you, and you're rich. You're rich. Why don't you just get yourself on the ballot as the Trump, you know, party, or just Donald yeah. Trump? And and you're, well, and it, I'm, look, I, I don't, I don't, I don't. And know, there's going to be a Republican primary against you yeah. by, you know, someone uh, serious. And the, the party label under which you're running is probably less popular than the Democratic Party label. It has been for a long time. You know, you can make an argument that it would be very attractive for the incumbent president after four years to say, I, you know, I, I, I didn't get into this to be a Republican. I got into this to make America great again. I'm committed to that mission, and I can better accomplish it if I'm free to party labels. Yeah. I think that could be a pretty appealing message to a whole lot of people. If he's, if he's ex trying to expand his electorate of, of working class folks that are not necessarily tied to the Republican Party, he may be more attractive to those people, not as a Republican, but as an independent instead. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you see much of it happening at the state level? I mean, I suppose one, I mean, one thing I'm struck by is how little there's. I mean, we had Perot. We've had these flare-ups of third-partyism. And you, the way you describe Trump, it's certainly reminded me of Eisenhower, even a kind of a guy who wasn't really affiliated with either right, party. Right. And, but after all these, either Eisenhower himself or Perot, we, or even Ventura and Schwarzenegger, it, it's surprising how little there's been, yeah. I would say, at the state level. I guess maybe that's just the institutional barriers. Yeah, there's... there's the, Yes, there, there are. First of all, Eisenhower is an interesting example, and this is a question about President Trump. Eisenhower, you're right, was not really a Republican or a Democrat. He chose the Republican Party for a variety of reasons. But once he became president, he decided it was his mission to modernize the Republican Party. And he became a very loyal Republican right. and, and while trying to change the party into something better. Maybe that's what Donald Trump will do, is try to devote himself toward transforming the Republican Party. I don't know. We'll find that, that all out. It's, it's harder at the state level. You know, my part of the country, the upper Midwest, has traditionally been a home of third-party candidacies, the progressive movement, the farm labor movement, the nonpartisan league, and things like that. Um, and and they, they come and they fade, and they come and they fade, and, you know, normally they're absorbed uh, by one of the two parties. Uh, and, you know, that's, I think that's why. I also think at the state level, it's easier for the parties to accommodate those impulses. Right. You know, state parties look like their states much less than they look like the country. And so, but, but at, at a national level. more than they look. Like. Yeah, right. Yeah. But at a national level, if you're running for president, you know, you've got to be the party. Uh, you, you define what the party is. So I think it's harder at the state level, but I, would, I still would expect we're going to see m more of it. You, it's not exactly the same, but you see efforts in municipalities to change the way in which we elect people, rank choice voting, and different experiments with different ways of electing people. This reflects an unhappiness with the simple two-party system that we've had in the past. I think you'd have to be a big enough celebrity problem or have a distinct enough issue to overcome the two-party, you know. I think that's the, still the, the case. Big, the, po the Coke and Pepsi problem. It's just hard to break through yeah. against Coke and Pepsi, even if you have a slightly yeah. better, you product. know, soda, right? Right, I right, mean, right, it, right, right. It needs to be really different or, yeah. or some huge and, problem and, and with and Coke and Pepsi. And, and the people we've talked about that have succeeded, whether it's Donald Trump or Arnold Schwarzenegger or even Ross Perot didn't get elected, but it was a successful candidacy in many ways. They were those kind of celebrity figures. There's no question about that. But the celebrity plus money, you'd think, really could do it. And, and if you could find the right state and 
that would be an interesting question for 2018. If when we're advising some super rich business, you know, a Bloomberg type or a Trump type, uh, whatever their views to run, I guess most of the time one would advise them go into this party, try to win the win the primary, yeah. and then you've got a good shot because this party in your state is either the majority yeah. party or, or, cl or close to being the majority uh, party. I, I think the uh, I think that's true. I think we also though w w there's sort of an assumption in that that that. You have to be rich to do it, um, but both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and Barack Obama showed that there are different ways of raising money now than there That's used a good to be. Point. And you know that l leads to the question of well, can you can you only raise that kind of money if you are a huge celebrity and everybody knows who you are and they'll they'll punch send and send you twenty five dollars. I'm not so sure about that. I mean, it may be a whole different way of structuring political fundraising that enables yeah. an independent candidate. With Obviously, you have to have something going for you. But I, I think it remains to be seen. It's an open question. Can, can you mount a candidacy? C certainly, the barriers to political fundraising have, been, have, have fallen a great deal because of the Internet. You can raise money now and, and, and because of the changing nature of the media. So it's at least in theory possible for candidates to come forward and fund a campaign without being personally wealthy. And I suppose people on the Republican side, like us, we've been so obviously in the country, has been as obsessed with Trump, but he won, so it's a whole different level of, I mean, it's right. important. Uh, I think San the Sanders phenomenon, do you agree, has been just undercovered and underappreciated as a oh, yeah. fact. I mean, yeah. no one thought in two years ago that Bernie Sanders, the probably the most left-wing member of the Senate, presumably, someone who was too left-wing to be comfortable calling himself a Democrat, and so he ran as an independent, yeah, though he caucused yeah. with Democrats, would, you know, he didn't really quite come close to beating Clinton, but he put a scare into her, and he got 44, I think 45% of the vote nationally, and it wasn't as if he was a charismatic young guy who was, yeah. you know, <laughs> right. uh, who, and it wasn't, the, you know, it wasn't as if it was an ethnic candidacy or a you know, racial candidacy or something distinctive or the first woman that was on the other foot, you know, yeah. uh, an old uh, Jewish, you know, left-wing <laughs> socialist Democrat. gets 40, <laughs> What does that say? I mean, I really do think that's, we haven't thought, of, people haven't generally not, Internalize what that could say going forward, you know. And, and we, and I, most of me, me and most of my conservative friends, you know, we, you know, we sort of look at the left as kind of a spectrum anyway. So Sanders, of course, is to the left of Obama and Clinton, but it's all kind of one, you know, it's one swamp of big government progressivism, and it's just yeah. he's a little more extreme. But maybe we're underestimating the kind of distinctiveness and importance of the Sanders phenomenon. Well, I think I think there's something there for sure, and I. I guess what I would grab onto is, uh, as much as you and I may th look at, oh, certainly Obama and maybe even Clinton as being on the left, there was no sense that they were trying to reject the American economic system. That's you know, every, every now and then somebody would say, you know, is Barack Obama a socialist? And the pushback on that was very, very strong. Right. How could you say that? Well, Bernie Sanders is a socialist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he does reject, and, and I, that, that's, I think, the key to sort of beginning to understand the difference between his movement and others. It's a movement of people that are ready to reject the, the basic tenets of American capitalism. We haven't really had that before in a major party candidate or major, a major candidacy. I don't even know how to describe him because he's, 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 he's not a Democrat and yet he's the, maybe the most influential figure in the Democratic Party right. today. I mean, he's the first person to endorse Keith Ellison for Democratic National Chairman and he's not a Democrat. But he has become, in effect, a Democrat. And, yeah, and it speaks to your point, which I think is a very important one, and I think it's a huge contrast with foreign parties, that we absorb our yeah. insurgent movements. Yeah. That's partly, very much, I think, because of the federalist nature of the party, so that, it, that they don't have to absorb them in Europe, where it's centrally controlled parliamentary parties, and therefore they don't choose to absorb them, and therefore you've got third and fourth parties on the right. 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 I think generally it's an unhealthy thing in the U.S. that you get the Tea Party emerges on the, U on the right and it becomes part of the Republican Party, right. and which I think both allows you to get hopefully the, the best of the kind of the new thinking and the insurgency, but also to not let it go off the rails into craziness, you know. Right. And, right. and so right. you get Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio in the U.S. Senate instead of having some, you know, I don't know, Le Pen-like third or fourth party against the established conservative right. party. Right. And the same on the left. Sanders would be the perfect example of that. And I guess if history were to obtain, you know, Sanders should be like Ted Cruz, and they both ran and lost, and they'll, but they're major figures in their party, and one assumes they'll stay in their parties. And 
have heirs, or in Ted Cruz's case, maybe run again yeah. four years or eight years from now. But I don't know. Maybe, as you say, with the incentives having ch the, the the barriers being lower, and or one could imagine an issue or two coming up, which really splits the party. I suppose that's possible. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, just to think about what seems to be different about this particular moment in our history. You've always had, or often had, movements of people on the left or the right into party politics, and they're all, they always cause alarm, uh, whether it's the anti-war movement or the civil, war movement, civil rights movement of the Democratic Party, or uh, on the right, the Tea Party, we can talk about. Goldwater and Reagan, Gold of course. Water, Reagan, yeah. uh, the movement of evangelicals into the Republican Party in the 1980s. Always, and, and what usually happens is you have an election or so, and all those people come in, and they raise hell and people get alarmed by it and then after the election the more irresponsible elements sort of fade out and they go back and doing their own thing but the ones that that stay have figured out how the system works and they want to yes they want to change it and they want to improve it, but they become parts of the party and become the new party leaders and the question is that still what's going to happen with the Trump phenomenon in the Republican Party, and even more, question in my view, with the Sanders phenomenon in the Democratic Party, because Sanders does not appear to be trying to lead his people into being absorbed into the party. He wants to fundamentally transform the Democratic Party into something very different. I, mean, I suppose one question will be, will there be real primaries in the Democratic Party in 2018? They have a bunch of moderate, sort of moderate Democrats from at least from Trump states, from red states, who are for re-election. And the normal political analysis, I've, you know, over the last, now that people have begun looking ahead at 2018 as well, do the Republicans have a chance to defeat, you know, Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota or Tester yeah. in Montana or, you know, Joe Donnelly in Indiana? And at least maybe, maybe we conservatives don't read the left-wing press as much as we should, but I don't know if people, are people also talking about, are they going to get, are these guys, once they vote for a couple of Trump, uh, to confirm a couple of Trump cabinet nominees yeah, yeah. or vote for some, Trump uh, legislative uh, uh, initiative conceivably, will they get primaried? I mean, are we looking at a possible big fight in the Democratic Party coming up? I mean, that's... Uh, well, I think they're headed for that. I don't know if it's going to generate candidates like that or not, but there's, they're, they're headed for a position where you have to be against everything that Trump wants, even if you believe in it. I mean, and it's, if your state uh, yeah, it's, is it's, it's, well disposed there's, to there's, it. There's no if, exceptions. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're for anything that the president wants, you're, you're going to be primaried or we're going to threaten you with primaries. Now, whether they can actually recruit people, I don't know. But, you know, we have saw on the Tea Party right the right. intensity of opinion produced candidacies. We didn't know who was going to be running, but it produced candidacies, and it may produce them on the left. And very subtly. I mean, I yeah. think people, we take it for granted now that it happened, and Ted yeah. Cruz and Marco Rubio, uh, and they was, emerged. Didn't people? I don't recall much of that happening in 2008. Was there any any no, appreciably? I don't, I don't think so. It and then suddenly in 2010, in state after state, they're running. Some of them are winning. Some of them are costing the Republican right. seats in Delaware right. and stuff. Exactly. Right. But it's you know it can happen pretty <coughs> really and, and, quickly. And, and some of them were were people who had been sort of gadflies in the party, and suddenly they emerged as uh, uh, serious candidates. I mean, they didn't. In, in most cases, they didn't win election, but. That could well happen on the left. It wouldn't surprise me at all. And, and the narrative that the Democrats lost to Trump because they weren't true enough to their principles, meaning far enough to the left, has really won the day, which we might have anticipated. Uh, that's usually the incentive, the, the way a dynamic a discussion goes in a political party, but not always. After the Democrats had been out of power, as you well remember from Reagan Bush years for 12 years, the argument by Bill Clinton that we needed to basically move to the center as Democrats was the powerful argument. But that's not, right. th that argument isn't even advanced in today's Democratic Party. It's all, we haven't moved far enough to the left. Yeah, no, that is really striking. And, and then, I, so I suppose you could have, let's say, what happened with the Republicans in 2009, 2010, happening with the Democrats in 2017, 18, that would be somewhat parallel. Yeah, we'll, Tea we'll, Party equals Sanders yeah, we'll followers. Yeah, we'll have to watch and see. But the difference would be that Obama did unite the Democrats as president, partly by bringing Hillary Clinton in and partly just because 
you know, he did unite them. I mean, he was kind of in the center, probably center-left, but enough center that he didn't uh, terrify centrist. They weren't centrist Democrats. There weren't many left. And anyway, he certainly dominated the Democratic scene. Well, never, you're, there you're, was never a serious possibility that he would get primary. It didn't seem. Sure. And, well, you're, 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 the, 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 the left wing of the Democratic Party felt like their guy was in. He may not have done everything they wanted, but right. at the end of the day, he was their guy. It's like conservatives in the 80s thought Reagan was there. So right. he, he, Reagan compromised an awful right. lot of things, but didn't there was never going to be a full-scale revolt because, after all, he was our guy. And the centrists weren't going to oppose Obama because he was centrist yeah. enough yeah. and he had yeah. Geithner and Bob Gates and people yeah. that, you know, the first term at least, the way Reagan, there was never, That's there right. was not going to be another John Anderson att attempt to go after Reagan in 84 because Certainly right. he had done well enough and did very well, actually. But I guess the difference this time, the point I'm getting to is, so we have the, the, the let's say, the normal fight within the, Denver, within the out party to define the future and partly discussed with the losing candidates. It's just like they were discussed with McCain in 08, and the Tea Party came up, you know, so, so the Sanders supporters this time discussed with Hillary Clinton. But we also have an incumbent president who it's not clear will unite his own party as Reagan and Obama did, and where you could imagine he splits within the Republican Party in primary challenges. Now, do you see this much in 2018? Will there be Trumpite in open seats? So there are all these Republican, there are all these Democratic senators in red states or right, purple states, right, right. open to challenge. Will there be a Trumpite Republican and a, let's call it establishment Republican and running against each other in Indiana and, and Montana uh, you know, and you know, Virginia we, and all over the place? I mean, know, we don't Minnesota? Know. I mean, yeah, maybe we, we, don't, we don't know that. And I think that the answer to that will become clear when we see what kind of fights emerge in the Congress itself over issues and what kind of compromises what kind of compromises the president is willing to make, what kind of successes the Congress has in enacting his agenda. And if you get, if you get to many votes that can be determined as selling out to the establishment, uh, then you can see a Trumpite coming forward, not necessarily with the encouragement of the president. They just assume that this is what would be good, and they're going to challenge Paul Ryan in a primary or something like that. Um, I think the bigger question is what happens if, if – for some reason, the the uh, the Trump agenda falters badly in yeah. the Congress, and I, by the way, like the Trump Trump agenda by and large. I like the tax reform idea. You know, I like. I'm sure that whatever Betsy DeVos wants to do on education, I'm going to like. Lots of things here that I think are very very positive. But what if the Trump agenda in Congress falters, either either because he doesn't lead it effectively, or because Congress is dysfunctional, or whatever reason? Is is he at that point? going to assert his independence, basically, and will a lot of people come forward and say, the problem is we have a Congress that can't enact the president's agenda. We have to challenge Republicans in the Congress. Could happen. And, or does, and does he encourage such challenges? He, it's not like that's never happened in American history. Yeah. I need to go back and read about Roosevelt in 38, but, you know, they all got overtaken then by the war, obviously, and so yeah. one doesn't know what the Democratic Party would have looked like in 1940, I think. Roosevelt having challenged a bunch of sitting senators right, in 38, right, right. lost. I mean, would have, you know, he probably wouldn't have had the third term. Would you have had a huge blow up? I mean, it's not inconceivable, right? Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's hard it's, to we, rew we we rewind the history on that. But that's where I think, yeah, if, if Trump fails in Congress, let's just say, or the, and if Trump and the Republican Congress together, uh, which right now I think most Republicans are thinking, well, Republican, as you said at the very beginning, Republican president, Republican Congress. Might have our doubts about one or both, but mm -hmm. hopeful better than Obama. Maybe we can get oh, some yeah. stuff done. Yeah. If that is not the mood a year from now, because the tax plan has fallen apart and nothing got passed and the Obamacare replacement wasn't agreed upon, and so Obamacare still exists or has been repealed, but nothing is replacing it, what does that world well, look like politically? What, yeah, I mean, well, here, yeah, that's exactly right. What, what you're describing is if the Republican Party fails. Yeah. And the question, the follow-up question then is, is Donald Trump going to remain loyal to a failed Republican Party that he wasn't really part of? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can imagine that maybe he'd decide, no, I'm not, you know, you guys couldn't get your act together. You couldn't get my agenda passed. I showed you how to win in the last election, and you failed. Yeah, that's very interesting, actually. And to just close maybe then by looking at the next year, we're speaking in mid-February, so, uh, but, you know, what do you think? I mean, what are these just analytically kind of the odds of, 
let's just call it success or failure to oversimplify a little bit here. I mean, it's been a huge amount of enthusiasm, Republican president, Republican Congress, first time obviously since 2006, uh, not that 0506 was a model of success, incidentally, quite the contrary, so maybe that's a warning sign, but still, first time in 10 years, first time I think for most members of the House and maybe for most Republicans in the Senate, even though there's much less turnover there, that president. they've had a re majority and a Republican president, yeah, yeah. Um, since you have to have been there in 2006 for that to have been the case. Um, and so the first time they've had a new Republican president with, a, you know, with momentum, so to speak, in the majority. Um, so people haven't really thought, I mean, what is that, what would be the moments to look for in the next six, nine, 12 months <clears throat> where we can start to say, ooh, this is, we're on one path or another. I mean, do you think is it? What are the two, are there two or three big inflection well, points or tests or? I, you know, I think the success of the Republican Party and the success of the president are tied together, and so you have to look at the president's agenda in front of the Congress. And we can say much of this is going to be shaped or influenced substantially by, particularly Paul Ryan. But it's gonna, the the question is what happens to the president's agenda. And the president's agenda includes reform and repeal of Obamacare, an infrastructure bill, tax reform. I think, you know... You think it is the president's agenda. I, th I think it's... Clear. Some people are talking about, you know, Ryan and McConnell will work it out and the president will kind of, you know, well, give speeches. Well, it, it'll be seen as the president's agenda. And I don't think you can accomplish that without presidential, sub substantial presidential leadership. Um, Democrats have slowed that down by, you know, obstructing the confirmation process for cabinet secretaries, but it'll, it'll go forward. But I think they've got to do those things. I think they've got to succeed in, you know, the, and there are big unanswered questions. Uh, per, the financing of infrastructure is a big unanswered question. Uh, implications for the deficit of all this are a big unanswered question. But I think if the Republicans don't come out of this having done some very big things, uh, I think that it's good, they're going to suffer. I mean, the, we know the normal midterm dynamic is bad for the party of the president. There's at least an outside chance the economy will sour rather than strengthen. That would be really bad. The only alternative they have is to say, you sent us to Washington to change things, and we did a number of things that are very positive. And I think, you know, taxes and infrastructure are our biggest on that list. I, I think the best you can do on health care is kind of neutralize it as an issue. It's not, a gonna, it's not going to be a winning issue for Republicans. So they need to get past that and then do something on tax reform like the president wants to do and figure out how they can deliver on infrastructure. That's a pretty good agenda, actually. Obviously, things will happen in the world and there'll be crises and sure. Trump will respond well or not. But but I suppose what, yeah, so I think that's A good national security team. I mean, let, let's, let's say for, for all the concerns people have expressed and the dusting up in the news of all the problems, Russia, all this other stuff, we've got really competent people at state and at defense and at the uh, CIA. You know, I, I, I feel like that the, the, the national security foreign policy complex is coming together, maybe with a little more controversy than we wanted to see, but it's coming together pretty well. Okay, well, I hope that continues to come together. And, and of course, the world is the world. You have hope, Bill. I have hope, but just the world is the world. You can have the best people the world you is know, the world. in the world. The world. You just yeah, well, know. that's, no, I, I mean, let me And clarify. the president matters or yeah. so, yeah. But you're right, the world is the world. I, 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 I've thought for a long time that presidents and presidential candidates for a long time have gone way too far in blaming everything wrong in the world on their predecessor. I, I think that Obama really was guilty of that with, with Bush. But I think that we have been guilty of that with regard to Obama. There are some big problems in the world that are simply really difficult to solve. Right. And, you know, I don't, that, I'm, I'm not pessimistic or fatalistic about right. it, but I think you've got to acknowledge that this, this is a difficult, turmoiled time in the world. But to get back to, 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 I think, your very interesting sort of scenario, it does seem to me, that, and I had not really thought about this, that a year from now there could be a moment if, let's just say, the Republican agenda fails on the hill. However you define However define that and whoever's to blame. But the people right. have the sense that, right. gee, there was a united Republican government for the first time in a decade, and they had big promises, big hopes of change. This was a change election, and it's not happening. And then on the Democratic side, one has big fights still uh, within that party between, let's call it the Sanders wing and the you know, Clinton wing, I guess, just to make it simple. And they were evenly divided in 2016, basically. Why won't they right. remain evenly divided? You know, yeah. Maybe Sanders picks up some momentum, so it's more even. I think that's possible. But, so he has a slight edge. But still, there are plenty of states where presumably there'll be resistance to that part of the party. Yeah. As long you as could have 2018 could be an extremely unusual year, yeah. don't you think? Yeah, well, I absolutely Have we had a year when both parties were sort of battling about their 
identity and, and with sort of, you know, primaries range, raging in both parties. I mean, that seems unusual to me. Usually I, it's I, like one or the other, one right? Or the, one or the other, but it could happen with both. I think that's entirely possible. And you, the, the, only, the, the only advantage the Democrats have is if you have these two factions, the Sanders faction and uh, whatever you want to call the other faction, it's easier for the more establishment faction, since they are in the minority, to accommodate the Sanders people. Right. If they were in the majority, which is the a problem the Republicans had when the Tea Party emerged creates a real problem because you can't accommodate your more, if you will, extreme faction because you got to govern the country. Democrats don't have that problem, so it's, it's going to be easier for them to paper over some of these differences. Now, the downside is they will become a real left-wing party in the course of that, and I, I still don't think that America is a fundamentally center-left country. Which then just to finish up on this, if you look at the 2020 and that happens, let's just say the Democrats go down that course, they don't win the majority maybe because they're too far left or for other reasons 2018 where they only win one body, um, and then they nominate a left-wing presidential candidate in 2020. Then I guess the question is, is there a market for a sort of a cent I don't know, it's, so much depends on what Trump has done, of course. There could be a market for a centrist against the, the left and Trump. There could be, Trump could be the kind of weird populist centrist against yeah. a conservative and a and a left and a left wing Democrat. I mean, it's, this is where Trump is really. I say this. I think you and I have had this conversation before too. That the conventional view of what a third party or independent candidate would look like has always been Michael Bloomberg. It's the upscale, liberal uh, on social yeah, issues, yeah. allegedly conservative on economics, <laughs> sort of internationalist, traditional internationalist. Yeah, yeah, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and there is a market for that in a world maybe of Bernie Sanders and Trump. Well, that's, I think that's really the Clinton and Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio and Scott Walker and John Kasich voters, who were a lot of voters, I mean, yeah, if you think right, of the primaries. Right. But, this, but Trump has made it so complicated because he's a kind of weird, sort of centrist, sort of radical, populist version of something, which then sort of how does that fit into that? Well, I, you know, I think you're right. I, I think one of the things... Of, Trump has finally given definition to a term that I never quite understood, but we've heard over the years the term the radical center. Yeah. And it never made sense to me because I'm, you know, I'm conventional in my thinking. Politics goes from left to right, and the center can be anything but radical. Right. I think I think I understand that now. Donald Trump is kind of the radical center. He's not a, certainly not a left winger, but he's really not a right winger either. And yet, he's not a mushy moderate. Right. You know, without opinions, he's a, he's a radical centrist and. Stay tuned for the further definition of that term. Yes, that really is the opposite of Eisenhower, and I suppose you could argue that in that respect, you know, Eisenhower was a yeah. non-radical centrist. Yeah, it's you know, responsible centrist. The, 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 the problem, one of the problems we've seen, <clears throat> I think, in the, the well, I can think of my own state of Minnesota, where, where since Jesse Ventura, no one has succeeded on his party, the Reform Party's ticket of winning the governorship. Despite the fact some very good people have run, Tim Penny's friend of mine, and Tom Horner was a Durenberger aide, and they were both candidates. And it always struck me, as I said to one of them, I said, you know, the, the center has to be something more than splitting the difference between the left right. and the right. And that seems to be the problem that center, that, that's why this term radical center was always, at least in theory, very appealing to people. It was something not on either of the extremes, but with a very clear, definable message. Trump is the first person that's come forward to do something like that. We'll have to get back together in a year and see. See if, what happens. No, seriously, was, I think I, well, I think this has been for me useful and sort of. I always sort of say formulaically that I think the range of outcomes now is greater than it usually yeah, is, and we're yeah. on uncharted waters and various other cliches. But I think this has been useful for me at least and making more concrete the ways in which one has to think about that, especially the question of the party system, and especially the question of not just the Democrats having their own tensions and possible breakups, uh, the Republicans though having the same with an incumbent president partly possibly being the, yeah. the, the spark for the breakup. That's very unusual, I think. It's totally unusual, but uh, you know, we have to try to figure out what's the best reflection of America at this point in time. I mean, you, I don't think, I don't think I mean, people like you and me, I suppose, tend to look at it from the top and say, well, here's what's happening and how is the country going to react to what's happening? No, it's how is what's happening a reflection of what is already right. going on in the country? That's what Donald Trump, it, that's, what, that's what people like you and me who have been his critics, that's what we probably don't understand is the degree to which he is a reflection of something deep in the country right. that we didn't fully understand. And if it's deep and unhappy with a two-party yeah. system that 
we've been part of and that yeah. we has, you know, you might argue has served the country pretty well for a long time. Nonetheless, it, it might break through those kind of various uh, boundaries and uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, sort of uh, uh, barriers that have yeah. kept it up, yeah. whether they're legal or, you know, impediments right. to, right. to, but uh, they were real, but it may also be that, as you say, with fundraising and celebrity and other things, they're less strong than they were. And uh, it looks very strong until it falls apart, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. It, it, and then it becomes a Potemkin village. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Vin, for joining me today. It's a really uh, good discussion, uh, I, lots I, of fun. I enjoyed it very much. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.